My name is Aubrey Parker, and I think I might be the last person left. Hello? Anybody? Please. You know what used to be my dream? It was for everyone to just disappear. Who are you talking to? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 217. Out now on video on demand is Starfish, a meditation on grief and regret set within a post-apocalyptic world in which a young woman, played by Virginia Gardner, tries to survive in her late best friend's apartment as a bloodthirsty creature prowls the snow-ridden streets outside. An intoxicating blend of introspective drama and creature feature thrills, Starfish is a thought-provoking and heartfelt sci-fi horror drama, sure to stir the souls of it, those who view it. Joining me now to talk about Starfish is the film's writer and director, Al White. Al, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know how to follow up on my intro. Great. <laughs> I try my best to get those, those intros really good, because uh, and I especially like to do it right in the intro for this film, because there's so much I need to talk to you about. I mean, it's such a interesting and compelling movie something that i came across in the research on your film is that i read that all funds from this movie is going to cancer research is that correct um it, all of my funds are yeah. all your funds anything that i have for the movie is going and i imagine that kind of charity on your part has something to do with the influence and origins of this story yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it really, I was working on a different project, um, and then my best friend passed away to cancer, and I was going through some personal things in my own relationship at the time. So it was kind of you know, like, um, finding it very difficult to deal with. So I wrote the whole script really just as a cathartic way to try and deal with. I didn't expect so much of it to anything um, at the time, so it only felt right that it wasn't just at that point. So yes, like, yes, and then we should go to cancer <laughs> because it, the film has helped me through a very dark time. I find, if, from my experience, that usually when um, filmmakers do something that's sort of biographical or, uh, in, in, in nature, or at least in this case emotionally, there's a lot of, a lot of emotional investment that the characters that portray their side of the family, uh, their, side, their side of the story, um, personifies them in some way. Um, in this case, though, you have a female lead um, in Virginia Gardner, um, who a lot of people know from the TV show um, Runaways. Um, the decision to use a female lead as opposed to a male lead, um, how did that come about? I mean, in, I mean, yeah, 100%. Um, Aubrey is just me, um, pretty much through and through, and, and Virginia had to spend a lot of time with us questions and just anything that she wanted like I let her kind of access to anything she needed to ask I would answer so she could kind of understand my process with what I was going through um, but then obviously she had to bring herself into that and that's what like, good actors can, can do is relate someone else's experiences into their own and, and create a new persona from that um, but in terms of like writing as a female to be honest a lot of the time I write I don't write whether it's a guy or a girl um, I change that at the end of the script when you kind of reflect upon it mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's really that important which sex a lead character normally is um, unless obviously you're trying to make a statement film um, so yeah with this one though to be honest it was partly just self-preservation uh, I, I learned a long time ago that if you just change the sex of your character no one thinks it's you anymore and when I was writing it now it's kind of seems ridiculous because I've been quite open about the fact that this is a personal story. But when I was writing it, you know, I was in a very introspective, self-deflective kind of messed up place. And I didn't want to necessarily draw attention to the fact that I was writing something as, as honest as it was. So just by changing the sex, people would read the script and not once think that it was about me. It was nice. The film pretty much deals with an end of the world scenario. Um, considering... The material itself, where you're coming from, with the origins of the story, is very much a dramatic kind of thing. How did the kind of sci-fi horror kind of aspect weave its way through there? Um, it was never, I mean, it, it was very organic for me. I never made a decision to do it in the genre space. I'm just a huge genre fan, so I think it was just always, I mean, anything I've ever written always has tinges of genre in there. Uh, whether it's horror or science fiction or just something that's a little bit magical, um, because... I don't know, that just it appeals to me to have very dramatic, grounded, centered to a film, but then to have things, you know, a little bit of magic surrounding it. 
Um, so it was always just there. And to be honest, when you're doing something that's about grief, if you do it as a drama, I think that's very noble. I don't think maybe I'm a good enough writer or director to do it like that and keep it interesting because I, it's just so much easier to do genre um, and get right inside the headspace of that character because you can obviously get very literally metaphorical with uh, with whatever's on screen. Um, and that was a lot easier to be expressive in the way that we wanted to be. When dealing with that type of scenario, I find two key things you need. You need a really strong uh, lead, because usually they're going to be on the screen all the time. You had that in uh, Virginia. Second thing you need, really good location. Um, and a lot of times you will need empty spaces to work on. You know, if it's in a world, not many people are going to be around. Uh, logistically, um, trying to find the right places for for right place to set your story in. Um, how did it come about that you ended up shooting in um, Colorado? And what was it like trying to uh, get a small town to be empty the way that it was so you can get shooting done? Um, so when I wrote the script, um, I'm, I drive a lot. I hate flying, so I, I tend to fly to New York and then drive across to LA and then back again about four times a year. Um, and I love Colorado. Um, I'm a big, just the mountains just make me feel more peaceful. So when I was writing the script, I actually went to Colorado for about two weeks and went into a cabin in the snow and, and wrote it. And then I did the same thing a year later to kind of do the rewrite on it. Um, but we didn't initially think we were going to shoot there. We were looking at South Dakota and a few other states, um, just anywhere that had guaranteed snow. And I wanted something that had some character in, in the town. So I wanted like a mining town or something like that. Um, and we nearly ran out of options, to be honest. We couldn't find what we were looking for until I remembered I'd been once to Leadville in Colorado, which is the highest town in America, I think. Um, and it's about nearly 11,000 feet. Um, and we knew it would be a challenge because the altitude obviously makes it very hard to do anything physical, um, which was very tough for the crew. Um, but the people there were very, I think before we got there, they were a bit nervous because they don't have many people film up there and they're quite, you know, obviously secluded and tucked away. Um, so I think they were worried we were going to come and mess everything up. But once we got there, they were very, very lovely and, and very kind to us. Um, and in terms of it being deserted, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty quiet town anyway. So, I mean, you could just go out and get certain shots anyway. And then there were a couple of bits that the town worked with us and shut down a couple of streets just for you know, a few hours here and there so we could get some of the bigger uh, the biggest things like that. Usually when, um, like say in Australia, for example, usually when filmmakers work in a small town, they might give them a glimpse of the film first before everyone else. Has the people of uh, where you of the Colorado where you shot that movie, had they had a chance to have a look at the film? The first person to ask that. And yeah, they were actually. They were the very first people to see it. Um, I was, yeah, I just got back from, our post wasn't quite finished, so it wasn't quite the act, you know, absolute 100% finished version mm-hmm. of the film, but it nearly and I just got back from England and I was doing a drive across America and I knew I was going to be going through Colorado. So I organized to do a little screening in one of the places that we would actually spend a lot of time when we were there, uh, one of the bars. Um, and they were very kind and hosted us there. Um, yeah, we had a bunch of the town people turn up, some of the extras turned up, like all that stuff. And that, yeah. so they were the first people to see any, any version of the film. There's a... But scene in the movie where Aubrey shares a fantasy that she had that she will wish she wake up and never will just vanish, and I think that's something that a lot of people share, just that that need for solitude at times. Um, when it comes to grief, though, um, a lot of times people say to properly grieve, you need to do it with, with another person to communicate, etc. Um, I, I myself, I've lost a couple of family members to cancer over the last couple of years. Um, it, it really is. Grief is different for different people. For yourself, was solid like that's kind of like solitude confinement, staying with yourself. I'm, I'm sure doing a lot of driving, you have like times of introspection and such. Does that help in the grieving process? I think. I mean, yeah, that's why I'm very. Well, hopefully, I'm very careful in the film because I don't like. I don't think in any film I don't like answers to be there. I think it's you know much better to kind of present some questions, but with informed kind of personal reactions to how that was for you. Um, so for me, I feel that with any emotional challenge that you're having, no matter how sort of extreme that might be, um, you, you do need other people for sure, I think, but I think more in terms of realizing that other people are going through this stuff. I mean, one of the main reasons for me to make film uh, is to be able to communicate. Like I think film is a wonderful form of communicating and making people feel less alone because uh, they realize other people are going through you know, different versions of, of the same challenges that they are. Um, but I don't think that it should be, 
I do think anything you arrive to has to be done from yourself. Mm. Um, I do think it's very important, it, you know, whether it's a tiny extreme, sorry, a tiny version of something like someone just trying to quit smoking or something to an extreme of someone dealing with suicide and depression. I think you have to arrive at those conclusions on your own. Um, but knowing that other people are there to support you on that, I think is, is very important. Um, and that's part of what we're definitely trying to talk about in, in Starfish is when that isolation can be a positive thing and when it can be very detrimental. Um, but at the end of the day, hey, you do have to take the steps yourself. You can't be pushed by other people. Um, so you're also dealing with a genre film here and there are elements of sci-fi, elements of horror. Um, speaking of which, the, ca- the creature designs that you have for this film I thought were really strong. I know you were no doubt working with a limited uh, budget, limited resources that use what you could, and I think you did a really good job in presenting that. When it came to the um, limitations that you had coming up with a creature that could be effective and scary, um, what type of processes did you go through? Did you uh, Do you yourself like to do illustrations? Do you have someone else do it for you? Did you look at other films? Uh, how did you come about um, designing your creatures? Um, well, yeah, thank you for thinking that um, I that We had planned to do it quite differently, to be honest. Like we did one originally. My favorite type of effects are practical with a little bit of CGI to kind of add magic to them. The kind of Guillermo de Toro style. Of mm. course, it's the most expensive way to do anything. So when you're working on an incredibly limited indie budget, it's not possible. Um, so we had to try and be smart with how we're going to approach the creatures. And I'm not going to lie and say that we got to do everything or we succeeded in everything the way I wanted to. But we were very, very lucky to have some great um, and a great effects team led by Mark Hutchins for the most part and then um, Cinecite who came on at the end to really help finesse those moments and, and to make them work. Uh, but in terms of inspiration and the process of it, uh, yeah, I'll do sketches. Like when I'm first developing film, I'll do sketches. Um, and then I did then work with a guy called Bowen Jiang who did some of our storyboards. And he did help with like designs and stuff and some costume stuff and creature designs. Um, and we were purposely, like there were a couple I had, I knew exactly what I wanted. And there were some that we pulled some ideas. Uh, like the only direct reference, to be honest, was the first two Silent Hill video games, um, which I'm a huge fan of the the way that they position demonic creatures um as a reflection of the cat lead character's narrative like they're, they're expressions of what that character is going through and not just sort of horror mascots and, and i love horror mascots but i wanted something that meant a little bit more to the lead character so we definitely pulled both sort of thematically from that and then a couple of the visual ideas from that as well um and then i get i mean a lot of people mention lovecraft i don't actually read lovecraft but I think there's a lot of influences for people that I like their work that are influenced by Lovecraft. Um, so I know, like, there's a nod in there to Gareth Edwards' monsters at one point. Mm. You know, there's a lot of touches that I think are sort of fire osmosis to do with Lovecraft. One of the first things that struck me when I watched the film in the trailer beforehand was just the imagery of the movie, the cinematography in this film is simply exquisite. It's excellent. You worked with Alberto Bagnares. Uh You worked with him previously, is that correct, in short films that you did before? Yeah, yeah, we've done a few short films together. And working with him now, uh, when approaching the material, um, what did you want to do with the imagery here? Because I just found that the colours just really popped off the screen, um, especially when you have the whites mixed with the blood and like the clothing that uh, Aubrey has as well. I think it was just fantastic. Um, um, it's yeah, honestly, like I feel very lucky when I found Alberto. Um, we started doing short films together. Um, I have difficulty finding DPs that I like to work with, and he's just just incredible. Like he's incredibly intelligent with things. And we spent uh, well over a year talking about this film before we actually started shooting it, um, just figuring out exactly how we wanted to approach it, making rules to do with the camera and its proximity to Aubrey, and we, we wanted the camera to reflect her spirit throughout the film. So when how far away it could get from her throughout the film was we'd make like diagrams and draw like circumferences around her for where we could place it and when she had to be in frame and when she shouldn't be in frame and things like this. Um, and we had to break from that sometimes because yeah, you get on set and things go crazy and you sometimes have to like ruin months of planning. Um, but no, he could just like take any idea it happened, just, just elevate it to a, a different level, which, which I do also have to say a big part. And I think it's something that's just not talked about enough with film. It's the, it's the colorists. Um, Daniel DeVue did our coloring on this, the, did the color grading and, and he did such an exceptional job. We spent, me, him, and Alberto spent like three days trying to figure out exactly how the film should look um, in the grade. 
and it took a lot of arguing to be honest to reach the point that all three of us were happy with it um but yeah i think that's like that's that final you know 10 percent that changes can make a movie wonderful or or terrible you know so i'm very appreciative for that well, you guys really did did a great job with the colour in this film. It was just, like I said before, just pops and it was just fantastic. Um, when it came to the notion of using a cassette player and cassettes, now, I, I imagine I'm 38 uh, years old, turning 39. I remember the days of cassette tapes. I used to make mixtapes myself. I consider myself a mixtape artist when I was younger. I, I used to love doing this stuff. I imagine you and I are probably around the same age bracket and you remember using uh, t- cassette tapes yourself? comfortable with that question uh but yeah yeah absolutely i grew up with cassette tapes and yeah doing that exact thing where you sit there like ready on your on the radio just to like press record on the song and try and like, not get the adverts around it. or the dj i hated it the worst when the dj would speak over the song that was the worst as well so the, the use of a cassette tape in we, we, we are living in a digital generation a streaming generation here you have a cassette tape that and a cassette player that is kind of like a, a conduit of sorts, so kind of like a, I don't want to give away too much of, of the plot and, and what uh, that does in the plot because I, I thought it was just really innovative and fantastic. Um, was there any to and throwing or maybe using modern technologies as compared to like older technologies or was using that something that was special to you uh, as, a, as a, not only as a director, but as a person um, who had a heavy investment in the story itself? Um, I mean, Really, honestly, like it was just a, a deeper personal thing. You have to kind of like become your own therapist and understand why you like certain things. Because people then would ask me why are there cassette tapes in this, at, you know, at the writing stage. And yeah. Like, no, it's like, no, I just I find them very. I love tangible media. I find it very romantic. Um, the truth is, like the friend who I wrote this for, we would give CDs back and forth to each other. We mm. play this on, and that's just not as interesting to look at. Um, and yeah, because tapes were my childhood, like that just made more sense. It wasn't a calculated marketing decision or anything like that. And now I think in some ways it's helped and in some ways it's backfired. But it's um but I just I just love the tangibility of it. I really do. I like having a relationship with media. Um, even though I completely appreciate all of the benefits of the digital age. I guess like I'm I'm fifty percent a grumpy old man. <laughs> I think we all are after we hit a certain age. Um, What's really interesting to me is that um, when Aubrey, and again, if I'm giving away anything, just let me know, but um, when Aubrey listens to these cassette tapes of certain things that happen, she gets transported, I guess you could say, to different kind of places. To me, it very much reminded me as when I was a young man listening to like the good old, you know, cassette Walkman, um, uh, whether in my room or wherever, I felt like I was getting transported to another place. Was that uh, an influence in regards to how you wanted to approach that kind of um, a part of the storytelling? Oh, definitely. Like it, so the, the cassettes really... On one side, they represent the seven stages of grief. Um, But on the other side of it, yeah, the music represents that ability of when you listen to something, particularly when you're beyond a certain age and you can listen to something and it takes you back to a certain point in your life, to a certain person, to a moment. And that can be incredibly joyous and incredibly painful. Um, And I think it's very precious to not overwrite that. Like, I used to want to... Uh, for instance, I was talking about this somewhere recently. There's, there's the Cure Wish album was something that was very important to me when I was a teenager, mm-hmm. and it became very tight to my first experiences with love and you know pain and just breaking up with people and just you know, stupid things that seemed like the end of the world at that point. And for many many years, I couldn't listen to it again because it just would take me back to that, and it was too painful. So I tried to overwrite that by listening to it again and again and again. And now I wish I hadn't. Like now I'm at an age where. I love having those little time machine windows. You can listen to something and be transported to that moment with that friend and you can smell the same smells, you know, and feel the same feelings. And I do think as you get older, you become number. So it's, it's, it's a love. Well, at least I'm becoming number. So it's like kind of lovely to, yeah, have these windows that take you back to when you really felt things for the first time. And I think music's very unique in that, how it can do that. Um, so that was definitely something that we're trying to express. Speaking of music, you composed the music for this film and um, I absolutely love the score um, that you put together here. Did you have compositions already from previous kind of projects or stuff that you brought to the project or did you just create stuff from scratch for this movie? So when we were on set, there was actually, we were in a bunch of Airbnbs in this town and there was one Airbnb that had a really old, broken, possibly haunted piano, um, which I would, I was playing on for a bit because I find it just relaxing. Mm. Um, and there was a point when me and Ginny were 
adamant that we were going to put a musical number in the film. So I wrote this like one minute, 30 second song uh, that we wanted to do as a musical number. And sadly, for many reasons, we didn't get to do it, uh, which is still my my personal biggest loss. I feel with the film is it doesn't have the music number that we want. Um, so that was the only there was a little bit of a theme in there, which I had. And then I didn't touch it for oh, goodness, a year and a half or longer. Um, and then when we we're at that point in post, I just kept putting the music off again and again and again, because you have to appreciate like the first draft of this I wrote in like 2014 and then we're shooting in 2016 and then post throughout 2017 into 2018. Um, and by the time I was in a very different place with my, my, in my own personal grieving process at that point, And I didn't want to have to go back to where I was when I wrote it in order to do the score. Um, so I kept putting it off and then we ended up with nine days before we had to hand over the music and I was in London. So I just bought this really crappy little MIDI keyboard, um, which is a terrible way to write strings on because you just get, you know, synthesized sort of loud, obnoxious noises. And yeah, I just didn't sleep for about three days, wrote the whole score using a little bit of that melody in one of the themes. Um, and yeah, I had to surround myself with like photos of my friend who had passed away and things just to try and like get in that mindset. And then went straight into recording it for three days after that uh, with a sound engineer called Ollie Jacobs who I've worked with on my own, on my albums and things. And then we just mixed it for two days and then that was it. And we had to create a lot of rules in order to make it work that quickly. Um, and there were definitely parts of the score that I absolutely hate because we had to do it that quickly. Um, but I do really like... Yeah, I, I'm not saying I would do that ever again, but I do sometimes like having that kind of that time pressure. I think can force you to be creative, force you to make smart decisions, and be brave. You know, um, and I think that's kind of great. What are the possibilities of having a soundtrack album for this movie? The score. I mean, the, so the, the songs. I know there's a playlist in Spotify, um, uh, but the score will definitely be coming out on digital. We're just trying to find. The, there's been a few people interested, and I just want to find the right people to to do something with that because I'm hoping to have a vinyl release as well but I don't know yet if that's going to happen what about a cassette limited cassette run <laughs> we did actually so when we did our, our world premiere at Fantastic Fest last year our sales agents Yellow Bell they uh, actually handmade uh, golden cassettes like the one in the, like the main one in the film that's cool and put some of the score put one of the songs and put just a dialogue into it and they gave it out to the press and stuff there which was cool um, last question, and I, I ask this of all independent filmmakers that I talk to. It's one thing to make a film; it's another thing to get it out there to the people. Um, you, well, for a lot of people around the world, they're going to watch this film on video on demand. Um, was there a limited theatrical run as well in the states uh, that you know of? Yeah, there was. We we um, yeah we did our own limited theatrical. It was actually Yellow Bell as well helped out with organising. Um, and we, I feel incredibly lucky about that. Like, I honestly was hoping to just screen in sort of four cinemas so you feel like you did something like that. Um, and we ended up with over 30 um, across America and there's some in Canada happening at the moment. And, um, and cinemas were just really lovely. A lot of the Alamo draft houses in America were very kind and supported us. And yeah, we feel very grateful for that. When it comes to having your film streamed as opposed to... Uh uh, you know, having people watch it on streaming as opposed to watching it in a theatre. Um, is that is that a thing where, as a filmmaker, because I talk to different filmmakers and some say, any way I can get my film out there is great as long as people can watch it, even on, a, on an iPhone, for example. They're fine with that. Other people would like to, would like to have long, had a longer theatrical run, for example. Is there a preference any way? Did you make your film for people to watch no matter on what device? Or did you have, want to make your film so people could watch it on the biggest screen as possible? Well, I mean, I think you have to separate what's smart for the film, what's smart for your career, and what's what's your ego talking, you know, um, which is very hard to do. I mean, I don't think... I, I've never met a director who doesn't want everyone just to see their film in a cinema on a large screen with, you know, great sound and all this stuff, which sadly isn't always how it is anyway when you go to the cinema and, you know, you can't make sure people are quiet and mm. stuff like that. So in some ways, it's better to watch stuff at home where you can control that. Um, but no, I don't... I mean, I, I really mean it. Like, I'm just grateful that anybody's watching the film um i'm not gonna lie it was definitely a thrill like i did a bunch of the q a's um do you know american theatrical and it was definitely a thrill going from cinema to cinema and and meeting the crowds and talking to people and you know getting immediate feedback it was terrifying um but i'm very open to the positive and the negative so i'm not gonna find that 
um, in terms of VOD, because yeah, we just we just went live with that um, actually in the last point, and that's a weird feeling to be honest. It's very surreal because that's completely uncontrollable. It's like you're not going to get to see any of these people. Um, you might just see some people comment on it on Twitter or something like that, and then you can gradually watch, you know, like the critic scores and the public scores, you know, go in completely different directions. <laughs> Or whatever on IMDb or on Rotten Tomatoes and things like that. So I mean, it's it's just surreal to be honest. Uh, but anyone who gets to make films is very very lucky. So, yeah. Well, the critics' um, reaction to this film has been really positive and for good reason. I was a big fan of the film, Al, and congratulations to you on that. And for everyone listening, Starfish is available on video on demand. I really strongly recommend you guys watch it. Um, it's it's haunting, beautiful stuff here. Hor- horrific at times as well, but it all blends together seamlessly. And I think that's kudos to you, Al. Um, you did a great job here, and I thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, seriously. You've been very, very kind.